Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we start, I'm, I'm Shannon from Gawad Kalinga. Uh, I'll just introduce the people who I'm with who are going to speak as well today. Uh, over here is uh, Alvi. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about his social enterprise. We also have Fabian, one of the whitest Filipinos I know. And, uh, <laughs> and he will talk a little bit more about his social enterprise as well. Uh, before we start, just to give us a bit of a background and a bit of a uh, briefing of what we're doing in Gawad Kalinga. Gawad Kalinga, by the way, is a term, a Filipino term, which means to give care. Gawad is to give, Kalinga is care. Okay, um, and so people are wondering, what the hell is this local term? Uh, Gawad Kalinga means to give care, because at, that's at the core of what we do. Um, and there's more to giving care than we think, uh, so I'd like to show this video, uh, tell a little bit more about what we're doing. That was the video. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna try and fix the video in a while, but we just wanted to continue, I guess, with our discussion. Uh, when we, I was in last year, we went to France and talked about Dawat Kalina to about ten different business schools, and the first picture that we showed France was this, huh? and this is a this is a picture of a community in the Philippines. Um, and this is a picture that can be ba basically anywhere around the country. And this is the picture of the Philippines that we all want to hide uh, as Filipinos. But the problem is this is how the world knows us. And this is how the world uh, sees us. We're like a country of people struggling, you know, people trying to, to make it. And uh, we want to go beyond just this. And our face to the world can be much greater than just poverty. And so we want to turn communities like this, and we're proud to show this, because this is what we've done to communities without uh, Galina. Wow. There. Now, so this is in Baseco. Baseco is a former dump site uh, that we've created uh, communities for uh, different uh, people, different communities, different sectors, just like those that you see in the picture. No? And that's the basic model of what Gawad Kalina did. And the story of GK goes way beyond just the houses. And we're known very much for these communities. Um, we've built 2,000 of these communities all over the country. We've built uh, homes for more than a million people. And the origins of Gawad Kalina is very interesting. It started from a place called Bagong Silang, which means newly born or, or a new beginning. Uh, but why it was called that way? Because it's actually one of the biggest relocation sites uh, in the country. Many of the uh, settlers from around the country were brought uh, from different parts, different provinces, were brought to that one place north of Manila. And um, the intention was good, but eventually it became one of the biggest criminal universities in the country. Uh, that's where people from different provinces banded together to survive. And eventually they, these became gangs. And uh, the people from Bacolod specialized in a certain crime. The people in Samar specialized in a certain crime. And uh, they wouldn't want to, you know, uh, change. So those are the people there. The, that's where they live, up at the corner. No? And that's Bagong Silang. That's where your petty thieves graduate to become murderers, to become rapists. And if you stay long enough here in the Philippines, and if you commute long enough, most likely the people who would rob the buses and would hold you up would come from this place. That's where GK started. No. And it started with one person, one person, uh, Tito Tony, the founder, who just decided to go there every day. Five in the morning, would go up, we would wake up, go to Bagong Silang every day, and would just, uh, for a number of years, would just sit and learn and would just talk to those who were already awake at that time. Why? Because whoever was awake at five or six in the morning, they were not the gang leaders or the gang members because they were awake very early. They're not high or anything. Uh, so that was the history. So these are the people who were former criminals. By the way, the, 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 the impact of, of Gawad Kalina, the former criminals. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and you'll see why, because some of the people, some of the people here who started with Gawad Kalina are actually now policemen and are nurses and are now teaching in medical school and are, are, are achieving so much more than just um, being criminals. So. And so that's the kind of transformation that has been done. But although many of the pictures that you see here are about homes and are about the communities, I would like to tell you one little secret about Gawad Kalina. 
Is that alright if I tell you a secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. The secret that the world should know about Gawad Kalinga is although we've built 2,000 communities, we've built homes for over a million people, Gawad Kalinga was never about the houses. GK doesn't exist for building homes. Uh, GK's vision is to end poverty for 5 million families by 2024. End poverty for 5 million families by 2024. Uh, and it goes beyond these homes, but it had to be built. These communities don't only have homes, they have clinics, they have schools, they have roads. These are things that they didn't have. Electricity, water, education. Um, and this allowed communities, whole communities to change from the ground up. But most importantly, from the inside out. Because once you put somebody in a beautiful community like this, built by Air France KLM, for example, uh, and many other partners uh, around the country, no? and once you put them in a place like this, from a slum like that, all of a sudden they realize, wait a minute, I'm human too. And wait a minute, I have dignity too. And um, you all of a sudden realize that you change whole behaviors and you instill different values. And that's where the work of GK actually happens. The first, the few, the, the, the early days of GK when Tito Tony started, it started as values formation. Just different camps, you know. Tito Tony talking to people like you guys here in rooms like, well, not, not as prestigious as these kinds of rooms, but very simple rooms and very simple areas in chapels, in sidewalks, in streets, in small stores, sari sari stores. And uh, that's where it started. He would, he would try and get whole gangs one weekend into a chapel and would sleep overnight there. And these were very powerful sessions, sessions where uh, gang leaders would say, hey, okay, it's time for me to change my life. It's time for me to renew. It's time for me to give up my guns. And they did have guns and they did have knives and they would give it up in front of Tito Tony uh, there. And um, very quickly Tito Tony realized that this is very powerful, that so many people wanted to change. So many people wanted to transform. The problem is, if you all of a sudden instill new values in a set of people, then bring them out of a community, into a community where these values are not supported, what happens? All of those things that you work for, that, that the values that you instill, just goes down the drain. So it's not only about instilling the right values, it's also about building a community where these values are upheld. Because all of a sudden, if they give up their knives, if they give up their guns, and they go back to Bagong Sila, what happens? They go into a community unarmed, and they have enemies there. And so Tito Tony very sadly had to bury many of these people who have been shot, who have been stabbed, because they decided to change their lives, but people around them did not. So that's where building these whole communities as safe havens, as productive areas, as secure zones, that's where the concept came in, um, to support these values. So at the very core, these are just the physical manifestations, the physical uh, structures that need to be built, so that the values will be will continue to exist. So this is this is our, the urban models that we have no? in uh, different communities. So I wanted to show you guys this, um, but not only in the city. This is I don't know about you, but my house doesn't have a fountain, or does it have such beautiful uh, landscaping? Maybe because I don't know how to landscape. Uh, but they used to live in things like that. If you put people in animal shelters. How do you expect them to act like human beings? Well, but if you put them in places where even you would like to stay in, maybe, just maybe, something can change. And uh, this is in Calamity Street in Bicol, um, where they used to live in very vulnerable areas right next to rivers. This is, this is very significant to the Philippines right now, given the recent uh, typhoons that have uh, struck us. And uh, by the way, just an update on that. Um, GK is already in the planning stages for rebuilding communities in Central Visayas. We're targeting to build over 20,000 homes, you know, and uh, we're partnering with different uh, organizations and corporations already. Of course, we're still continuing with relief. So anyway, we're doing that as well. Uh, so we work always continues with every storm, with every calamity. GK gets stronger and stronger because more and more people uh, see that this is the platform that we need to access. Uh, so this is in uh, mostly in Bicol, but we also have all over. This is in uh, the Sendong, Sendong victims in Mindanao. Uh, yes, Iligan, yes, uh, yeah, Sendong and Pablo were the two biggest typhoons before Yolanda. And so we built 3,000 homes that we awarded just a few months ago. And um, so that's the total 
number. So we're building more and more, even without the media. This is in uh, land. There was a landslide in. Uh, this is in Samar, uh, where we also build communities. We also build communities um, not only for for different back people from different backgrounds. No? Uh, we've built pe we've built communities for people from different religions. These are where this is we our saying also here is uh, we do not want to bleed in war. Instead, we want to sweat for peace. Uh, and uh, this is where Christians and Muslims can come together, build whole communities for each other. No? So this is really going. This is really uh, a tool by which we can generate so much healing, so much transformation, so much collaboration. Uh, so if you if you wanted to explain what the formula is of Dawat Kalina, okay, there's so many things happening. Uh, there's so many different uh, elements to it. Essentially, what is very different from what we're doing. Although we have a lot of people who contribute from the private sector, government is one of our biggest partners, uh, schools, corporations as well. We cannot do it without them. One thing that we pride ourselves in is the massive uh, engagement that we have with the base of the pyramid themselves. No? The communities themselves are not just beneficiaries, they're actually active participants in the whole development process. So they, you give them the opportunity, you give them the privilege to serve as well. And so that's how we, and then of course we put in these seven basic uh, ingredients, I would say to the formula, very basic. So you see food, you see youth uh, development, you see infrastructure. I wanted to focus on that third box from the left, values formation, very critical. No? Before they even start building uh, these houses, what we do is we get, go make them go through a whole program you know, that deals with different issues and deals with universal values that we want to instill. These are values of the family, of their role in society, their role in the country. Uh, and it's a 28 weekend values formation program that is continuous after the communities have been built. It happens uh, continuously. So that's the formula that we've been taken uh, and we've been showing around the world. So at the end of the day, our model comes about because of, and it's at that time when it was starting, people didn't really understand why we were doing it. Why were we painting the homes if we could spend the money on paint on more cement so that people can have gray houses, right? Or why did we landscape the gardens? Why did we build fountains, right? Why did we build all of that when all of it could go to, you know, building more homes? Well, we when a lot of people asked us that. We always say, well, you know, if you were to build a house, uh, you would have paint. You would have, in the cost also, is uh, landscaping and all of that. And we couldn't uh, continue the transformation process if they felt like they were just, you know, beneficiaries. We want them to feel like they are capable of really changing not only their own lives, but eventually also helping uh, to change the lives of others. So essentially what it is, uh, for us, poverty at the very core of it, we were talking a lot about values, it's a behavioral problem. It's a problem of, it's a painful lack of uh, caring and sharing. And um, with an economic consequence, it's a behavioral problem with an economic consequence. That's how we view poverty. Again, putting somebody in an animal uh, pen will make him act like an animal. Um, at, but at the same time, it's also on our end. No? We forgot, uh, at least as a country, we forgot to care and share. And we forgot that the real solution to poverty is also in our, is within our grasp, and it's on our shoulders to do it. And so we don't, we can work together with the communities to really truly end poverty. Uh, and so the progression has been, you know, again like the youth programs that we that Tito Tony started, all the way to now. This whole new field that we're getting into, we've un we understand that we got to this point because of philanthropy. And because of charity, and we've built 2,000 communities out of it. But now we're saying, how do we now go from 2,000 communities to 50,000 communities, to 100,000 communities? I was talking to our friends from Laos just now, uh, and we're now we want to build more communities. We've now built communities in Indonesia, in Papua New Guinea, in Guam. We're talking to people from Australia, Aboriginal Australia. We want to build communities there. In India as well, I was just in Myanmar talking to them, seeing what we can do to uh, build these GK communities there, also in Laos and Cambodia, um, and perhaps even Africa very soon. So this is a model that comes from another developing country that we can propose to the world. 
And we want Filipinos to end poverty in the Philippines. We want Indonesians to end poverty in Indonesia. You know, we want Asians to end poverty in Asia. Right? And so that's the whole progression. But we can't do that with charity alone. We want to create a model for sustainable growth. We want to create a model for social enterprise. And uh, this is what we feel is the path to take uh, so that we can continue to build, continue our work, and do it better and do it faster. No? And uh, we believe that we needed a new place to do it. When Bagong Silang, the criminal university I was telling you about, was where we learned how to do Gawad Kalinga's uh, first phase, is that we call it the phase of social justice. Here in the, in the Enchanted Farm Village University, which is where we're going to take some of you tomorrow, um, is where we're going to learn how to do our next phase. And that's the phase of social artistry. Trying to achieve higher than just the basics. Trying to achieve more than just um, the, what, what people need, but also what people dream for. Our communities now, if you ask our, the kids who are there, if you ask Jude, if you ask all of these guys from the farm, what do they want to do when they grow up? Before, maybe a few years ago, they would answer, oh, they just, just want to stay here, just want to you know, be a tricycle driver, which is, you know, there's nobility in that. Uh, be a carpenter, fine, there's, there's nobility in that. But what if they tell you they want to be a lawyer? What if they tell you they want to be doctors, they want to be businessmen, they want to go to college, they want to graduate and all of these things. And these are the dreams now that they have, and why should we stop them from dreaming that way? Because these are the dreams that you have. These are the dreams that I have for my friends and myself, right? So why can't it be theirs? So instead of saying, oh, sorry, we're Gawad Kalina, we're just gonna give you homes and then we're done, instead we're saying, okay, it's time for us to be creative, it's time for us to find new solutions, it's time for us to find new innovations so that we can fuel those dreams and get them into becoming reality, right? So we dream with them, we work with them, and then we continue the work. And so that's uh, essentially where we are now as an organization. We're now looking for ways to increase our capacity, we're looking for ways to sustain our efforts so that we can continue uh, their path to hope and their path to their dreams uh, to be achieved. And so that's what this Farm Village University is all about. So perfect timing. I will now try again to play the video very quickly, uh, not with this computer, but with another one. And uh, so let's see if this works. And then that's kind of just the backgrounder for what we're doing for Gawad Kalinga. Uh, again, as I said, we're in our second phase. There are, we started in 2003, 21, we gave ourselves 21 years, 2003 to 2024. And uh, we divided these 21 years into phases of seven years each. And we said the first seven years is social justice, very basic stuff. Land for the landless, homes for the homeless, food for the hungry. Simple, people need it. And, uh, Next, we said social artistry. That's where this comes in. Uh, countryside development, food security, and, and climate, climate change mitigation, and of course, the addressing of uh, extreme poverty. The third phase, we said, okay, once we've developed the countryside, once we've developed whole industries in the Philippines, we're gonna now try to get into uh, social progress, which is massive industrialization and really going through um, developing the country. So that's why it says they're phase two. Um, and we're gonna get to the phase, the third phase. And we don't know how the third phase looks like yet because we're not there yet. This is an ever-changing model. Uh, but I'd like to show you this uh, video now. It works. phase of our journey is uh, for us to heal a broken nation. As we ended the first phase of uh, Gawad Kalinga about uh, social justice by providing land for the landless and homes for the homeless, showing Filipinos that, uh, that we can end poverty in our country if we care for one another, if we share with our Bayanihan spirit you know, what 
how our gifts and talents will for all of us to rise together as a, as a people through Kalinga and Bayanihan who are able to build over 2,000 communities and really transform uh, the lives of almost a million people in the second exciting phase for now social artistry. Our target is for us to inspire half a million Filipinos to become social entrepreneurs. Sa pagtahak po natin sa Tuwing Nalatas, bibigyan takas po natin ang lahat, lalo na ang pinakamakatakakailangan. Ang paglulunsad ng Gawad Kalinga Center for Social Innovation, Social Enterprise Movement, ang magbukukod sa mga privado at pagpublikong sektor upang maglatag ng mapakabuluhang programa at napapanahong inovasyon sa pumumuhunan sa bansa. Ang layunin nitong makabuo at makahubo ng limang daang libong social entrepreneur sa loob ng anim na taon ay hindi lamang magbubunga ng kita sa mismong mga negosyante kundi tulong din sa buong komunidad na maaaring sanayin at umasenso mula sa mga negosyante. The uh, Enchanted Farm in Angang Bulacan is the first of 25 sites that uh, we are developing all over the country areas where we have a Gawad Kalinga community and we have at least 10 hectares of land. Enchanted Farm connects the students in the top universities with the community. And this is where uh, we see it, first of all, as a village university for social education. It is a village university for the rising Filipinos, where rich and poor uh, learn to be partners in development. But it is also an incubator for social business where we are able to attract business and management uh, students with expertise in technology and with interest also in mapping the creativity of the poor for us to be able to really create wealth that will benefit those at the bottom of the pyramid. So much talent that you see in the GK residents that today is just not used or not valued. I think like, okay, I have something to do, I have to help them. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. They have skills, talent, and opportunity, so maybe it's where I come in and where I can work together and build a social enterprise that will provide them jobs and secure the income for them to raise their family properly. I decided to, to start my own business here instead of bringing back to the I found more purpose into starting it here. After a year, we were able to sell more than 1,500 staff toys. It's good to blend with a, with a nation building organization that's actually showing how we can end poverty in the country. And this GK model can be also replicated all over the world. Parang yung dignity namin tumataas kasi may mga dayuhan ng pumapagda dito sa amin para lang mag-create ng livelihood kasi mahal nila. Dito na parang yung dahil pinagawa yung So now uh, we are working with corporations to go beyond CSR but to go for CSI, corporate social investment. We're looking at being part of the Enchanted Farm because we also have business in culinary school, we also own restaurants and we want to be able to put whatever expertise we have, you know, so that then more people can learn from what Gawad Kalinga is doing, more than just building houses, creating entrepreneurs, building long-lasting businesses, uh, so that then people can feed their family. So you have a house, you learn a livelihood, and then you feed your family. That's all it is. The GK has been identified as the most trusted organization in the Philippines. In the social enterprise, we try to really consider everyone, and the purpose of our business is not to maximize profit. We say that it is to optimize profit. Just make enough profit so that the company will be able to grow, but put a lot of that back into Gawad Kalinga and other poor communities um, to help them really develop. And it's only when business starts to really love this country that we will see a radical change and really a coming out of poverty of millions of our people. It has become simply a, a new season of hope. Uh, and Gawad Kalinga went through its own transition to this exciting phase of uh, social entrepreneurship, social tourism, social innovation. We're simply seeing that uh, Filipinos now are starting to really uh, discover that the Filipinos themselves are the solution to our own poverty. The next generation will see a Philippines that will be squatter free, a country that uh, will have the most slums, great abundance in the countryside, finally be able to live in a country where there is prosperity and peace because of the faith and the love of our people for God, country, and for one another.
the part. Anyway, uh, so that's essentially what we're doing for the second phase of our work. And this is, as you saw in the video, uh, and if, for those who won't be able to tour uh, tomorrow, who would be who signed up for a GK Enchanted Farm tour? Everybody, yeah. So for those who don't, who, have, who did not sign up for it, it's okay. Don't worry. It's open every day. You can go there, uh, and we'll be happy to have you. But anyway, you just did a virtual tour of the farm. Uh, it's much longer real life. Uh, the live tour is two hours, so enjoy. Um, Anyway, we'll have uh, more about that tomorrow. But this is essentially where uh, the next phase of GUK is starting. And uh, this started three years ago. Three years ago, I was fresh from graduation, from college then. And uh, I had done, oh, no, there was a job waiting for me in a big corporation, a uh, petroleum corporation. And I decided to turn that down. And I said, well, why don't I, because I heard of this crazy organization called Gawad Kalina, who at that time, I thought, just like many people, was just about building homes, but apparently not. No? And at that time, all of a sudden, I realized they were going into this new phase and going into this new element of things called social enterprise. And at that time, nobody knew what it meant. Nobody knew what the hell that was. And uh, so I said, perfect. <laughs> That's exactly what I want to do, something nobody understands. And uh, so my first day on the job, I had to wake up at 3 in the morning. Who wakes up at 3 in the morning for a job? Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> Only crazy people, that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and then I go to half, a, half asleep, half awake. I was driving. Uh, I don't recommend that. Um, I went to Tito Tony's house, the founder, in Commonwealth Avenue. And uh, he said, you know, I was at 5 in the morning. And he was already up and about, already talking, already being very inspiring. And he said, you know, Shannon, I'm going to take you to this wonderful place. And I said, cool, okay, where? I said, well, it's a, it's a hub, and it's a Silicon Valley for social enterprises. And this is a place where we can uh, get the best and the brightest and try uh, social entrepreneurship. And this is a Disneyland for social tourism. And it's a place where we can accommodate many people. They're going to do tours, and they're going to do demos, and they're going to do all of that. And uh, it's, a, it's a tourist destination as well, and it's an educational platform, blah, 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 our second phase of Gawad Kalina. I'm like, wow, why have I not heard about this ever before? He said, and then we just went, okay, straight there. I rode into his car, and <laughs> at the back of his car with lemongrass and flowers that he stole from his wife's garden to plant in the farm. I said, if it was so beautiful, why do you have to steal plants? And uh, one, hour, uh, one hour and a half, I stepped out of his van and I, and I said this is where the Disneyland is this is the first shot of the enchanted farm three years ago um, that's the Disneyland that's the Silicon Valley and that's where we started even our tricycles didn't have wheels so they were just they were not a cycle they were just a try <laughs> try to ride it not gonna work right uh, so this is where the, the farm started. This is the Disneyland that Tito Tony was talking about. So it, where is the best and the brightest? Where is the Disneyland? Where is the Silicon Valley? And you know, we just said, well, we just have to build it. And uh, that's how it started. So in my leather shoes, in my slacks, and in my long sleeve polos, just like JQ there, <laughs> I would, uh, he told me, okay, get that shovel and make these mounds flat by the end of the day. Because the following day we had guests, and they wouldn't be seeing anything much, but we had guests. Uh, and that's how we started. And three years down the line, uh, we're still continuing to build. What inspired us so much though, is that when we were starting, we had 50 families. 50 families, some of the most brilliant, most heroic people we know. And that's what we continued to look at. And that's what we strive every day to build. You know, better lives for them and for the many other families that can be affected by what we were doing here. And it's just a small band of people. I don't know who those three girls are anymore because it's been a long time, but it's just me. Tito Tony is there in the middle, Frank in the shades, Carl, who was very thin, um, not, not as thin anymore, he's now working with the senator, uh, and then me at the back, also a bit thin. Um, that's why it's a, dark, a bit dark, but uh, that's where it started. But from the very beginning, we said, let's start building the Farm Village University. 
Let's put these three terms together. The world needs a new model, a radical model of putting things that don't usually work together. We don't even see these things in one sentence, right? So he said, if you put those three things together, what will come out of it? Why those three things? Because we have land, because we have people, and because we need to relearn, unlearn, and learn many things. Um, and so, what does a farm stand for? Star a farm, very simply, stands for productivity, sustainability, life. Essentially, it's creating opportunities. Uh, and it's seeking out those opportunities. We are one of the richest countries in the world uh, in terms of natural uh, resources, biodiversity, fertile land. But our, our farmers are still hungry, but we are still poor. And so we want to seek out those opportunities in our farm. But it's also a village. Now, not only of the communities or the, uh, or the villages that you saw earlier, but it's also a community of change makers. A community of people who can build and who can uh, access this whole ecosystem of investors, stakeholders, entrepreneurs, supporters, and really create something in that university. I'll tell you a little bit more about the university. Some of the people who are part of this community, people like Alvi, who you'll meet in a while, people like, like Maricel, who is part of the community, she's a resident. She used to just make simple cheese now. She's a French, she makes, she makes French cheese now because we have French interns and they know their cheese. Fabian can tell you a little bit more about that. And some of our entrepreneurs. Tita Linda is one of the mothers in the community, along with Ron, my business partner. Together with him, we made Bayani Brew. Um, later on, we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Theo and Philo. Philo is that guy um, who's a computer programmer by profession, but he's also a chocolatier. Uh, and since all of these things uh, are part of this village. So a village for us, we've expanded our definition to building communities of entrepreneurs, of change makers. And here, I'd like to tell you another secret. You can be part and you are part of this village. No? This village is not only of people from the Philippines. This is a global village of poverty enders. No? Of community. This is a community of change makers no? and we can do it anywhere. And we can do it together. It's also a university, a university of learning, a university of unlearning. And there are many things that we need to unlearn in this country. The Filipinos have lost their soul. We've lost our soul as a country. Because we've, our two, our two options uh, after graduation in the country, in the, the Philippine experience at least, I don't know how it is in other countries. But for us, I graduated from Ateneo, I took up management with applied chemistry. There was only two options laid out for me. One is to go up the corporate ladder, which is fine. Uh, another is to go out of the country. That's it. Either way, you make other countries richer. Right? Uh, but for us, if instead of seeking just one job for myself, why can't I create 100 jobs for others? Why do I have to just try to achieve my own ambition if I can work for a common vision for this country and for this world? That's what we need to unlearn. That's what we need to learn as well, how to connect with one another. Uh, so that's what the Farm Village University is all about. And we believe that this is the first Farm Village University ever in the world. And that's why, for those who don't, haven't gone, or won't, who have, did not sign up for the Farm Village University, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have daily trips there. Uh, because this is a platform not only of people who know and have been there, but it's also like Tito Tony, the heads of Shell and Coca-Cola and Hyundai, it's not only of people who are just starting out, but of government, of experts, of, of academe, uh, and many other people who are part of this support system for entrepreneurs. And I guess this is where I'll introduce uh, the others. When we started, uh, I remember three years ago, we had this one little hut. It was very, very small. It was where we ate, where we met people, where we slept. Some, when we started, we were sleeping there, they didn't even have a roof. And uh, we said, how are we going to build all of this? We don't have money. This is, we're gonna need like a hundred million dollars just to build this, I mean 14 million pesos just for the road. 100 million pesos, I mean. And then 14 million pesos just for the road because we didn't have a road. Good thing Shell came in. Uh, but then Tito Tony said very, very quickly, he said, just build it and they will come. He said, I got that from a very, very wise philosopher. His name is Kevin Costner. Uh, he said, <laughs> he, and this is part one of his movies. And he just said, just, just do it, just land it. All of your ideas, whatever it is, uh, if if it has good intentions, just do it, do it. 
and uh, inspire people and uh, get people to see your vision. We've never written any single funding proposal to build this enchanted farm. And it's over 100 million pesos already. Uh, all we did was do talks like this. All we did was uh, share our vision. And we just did it. So we built everything from scratch. And then from there, everybody is now coming in. Uh, this is how it started. Again, as I said, this is the, uh, the week before the President of the Philippines came. It was, there was a typhoon, as usual, we're in the Philippines. Um, so we had to build everything. Now it's the GK Center of Arts and, for Arts and Culture. Uh, we've also already done additional improvements to this. Um, this is the community. This is what we did to it. Uh, this is what we mean when we say build it and they will come. <laughs> and you can see Alvi there uh, in his cool shades, which I think you lost. Um, it's in my car. So we've literally paved our way there. And uh, we had to build all of these things from scratch. These were the early days, what we were doing. Just wanted to show you guys this before, uh, because many of you won't be able to make it. This is the Shell uh, Center for uh, Social Enterprise and Innovation. It's where we're going to incubate businesses. We have uh, cabanas. We have, uh, we'll have a, a floating pavilion. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, we're going to have events. Um, again, no funding proposal. This is built by Yun. They, they built it themselves. We didn't even see the money. You can, this is where we're going to have our event tomorrow. This uh, simple structure that we found just with, just designed with toothpicks and matchsticks <laughs> and gravel is now built. It's now the Development Design Center. So this is how it looks. So all of that we're building. We're also working with different corporations like Virgaya to build the Culinary Center, as you saw in the video. Okay, uh, and then this one. We also are working together with government to build uh, things for trading farmers as well. So I just wanted to show you guys this to see that what you can do with just a small band of people who have the right passion and the right conviction for this. And uh, again, this is what uh, the orientation for a common vision can do. This is what we can do if we all work together. And I think the people who started this with us, I brought with me two very handsome fellows uh, who started this, one of the first two social entrepreneurs who uh, started with us. and. Uh, we get very good. We have we get so much inspiration from their hard work, and uh, we hope that that we also uh, grow an army of people like them. Our vision to end poverty: we want to have 500,000 social entrepreneurs by 2024. We now have 25, uh, but <laughs> we're still a long way to go. No? But uh, we feel that we can trigger something really, really good, and uh, we hope that anybody can do this. Not only, and this is 500,000, not only of people here in the country, it can be people from all over the world uh, who can join us in, in this course and be incubated here in the GK Enchanted Farm Village University. I'd like to call on now Alvi, uh, who will share a little bit more about his business and his experience with us in the farm. Okay, a round of applause for Alvi. So believe it or not, I'm actually Filipino. <laughs> so Bian looks just as Filipino as me. Um, uh, so my name is Alvi, and I um, just wanted to talk a little bit about this product that I have in my hand, uh, which represents uh, our brand. Okay. So as Shannon said, uh, story. My story is quite similar. I also was. I was in a conference like this. Um, I came from uh, one of supposedly one of the best universities in the Philippines, and uh, w when I attended this talk, uh, it was. Uh, initiated by my professor who said, oh, go listen to a man named Tony Antonio Meloto, who started Gawa Garinga. And I was 20 years old. I was a very skeptical uh, young college student. And I thought, oh, uh, NGOs are just out there to save the world, thinking they can save the world. But it's never going to work because multinationals are going to dominate and continue polluting our seas and earning all the money. And the rich will get richer. And the poor will get poorer. And there's no hope in life. I might as well just jump off the train, right? And I said, who is this Antonio Meloto, this Tony Meloto? Uh, ah, Gawa Kiling, okay. So um, it's become so widespread that I had actually experienced it in high school. So oh, the first thing that came to my mind was, ah, they build houses, yeah. And, th and then what, right? And then what? But then by some weird, weird occasion, when, I don't know, it started raining. Um, I bumped into a friend. I was supposed to go home. And I normally go home by train from where I study. And I said, you know what? I'll just check it out. What's there to lose? 
right? So I enter the conference room and it's about half this size and there are only one, thir one fourth of the amount of people um, in the room. Uh, and they're, they're actually started late because they were waiting for more people to fill out the room before starting. And so I arrived and I guess they're like, okay, we have one more person, we're so desperate for more people, let's start. And they started and after that talk, after listening to that 62 year old man with white hair uh, and meeting Shannon and Carl and Frank, who, whose picture you saw earlier, I uh, eventually uh, <laughs> made a dramatic decision. I dropped out of that school and started my social enterprise. Um, it, j it took one talk, uh, really, uh, very similar to what Shannon just presented now, although it was presented by Tito Tony himself. And he just kept going on about, oh, the rich are the, you're the real criminals. Uh, you go to the best universities and you have the most, but then our country is still poor. Why is this so? Why is that so? No, no, no. And after that, being young and rebellious, I challenged him and I said, hey, sir, if you think that you can save the world, or at least the Philippines, how, how can you get the poor to dream for more, right? Because I thought, in my experience, I think that's the one of the reasons why the poor remain poor and the rich stay rich. Because when you're born with almost nothing, how can you dream to be more, right? So I asked him, how do you get them to raise the ceiling? And he said, oh, by creating a Silicon Valley for social entrepreneurship, a Disneyland for social tourism, and what's the third one? A, a, a village university for the young Filipino entrepreneur. I said, wow, great, where is this place? Oh, it's in Bulacan. So like Shannon, I also went there and I didn't expect, I expected something that I saw in the slides, but what I saw was the same, mud, snakes. Uh, we actually got stuck there because it started raining and our cars couldn't make it out of the farm. And we slept over and I got feasted on by mosquitoes the whole night, I actually didn't sleep. And um, after that day, uh, I asked how I could get more involved, and I, all I really wanted to do was to, to spread the vibe, spread the message to, in my school, right? Which is um, supposed to be well, one of the best business schools. So I wanted to help get more people from the business college involved. And they replied, so I said, this is what I want to do, Shannon. And they said, well, you can't just do that. You have to start your own enterprise. Because following that philosophy, build and they will come. There's no other way to get more people involved in starting your own enterprise. And I, the first thing I said was, I'm gonna screw up a lot, <laughs> for sure. And they said, we know, <laughs> we know you're gonna screw up, but that's why we'll teach you. And I think being here for, for almost three years, I think I've tested everyone's faith in this organization, um, in this team, um, because they, they've had to uh, move earth, uh, move mountains uh, to support us, right? And that's what this place is for me. It's a support system, right? And and um, being still being here now, standing with our new brand, our, our good-looking duck that's wearing a barong, by the way, that's the native Filipino uh, outfit, and a chef's hat and a spoon uh, um, called the Golden Duck. Uh, so notice the play of words, Golden Duck. Oh, okay, 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 okay. All right. <laughs> and um, uh, I think it's been it's been such a journey. And um, it all started with this, with these yellow eggs, okay? So this is your first time to see yellow eggs packaged nicely in a, in a package, packaging like this. And it, it was all just a very, very simple idea that I thought was actually a joke when we first thought of it. Um, I didn't think it would land this hard and make such, such leaps and bounds, but it did. And if you're, in, and if you're not familiar, um, sorry, <laughs> if you're not familiar, um, with with the duck industry in the Philippines, well, it's it's focused on three main things. Okay, so for the Filipinos here, I'm sure you know, uh, there are three main products that come from duck in the Philippines, and the three of them are the first one in Tagalog is balut. Okay, how long have we have the delegates been here? How long have we been here? Our delegates from us. One day. One day. Okay, too early. But I heard they have balut uh, in Cambodia. Yeah, it's fertilized duck egg. Okay, and before it hatches, you harvest it, you boil it, and you eat it. It sounds so cruel. When Fabian first heard about it, he was like, oh no, but then it's so delicious and so good. Okay, <laughs> guilty pleasure. Um, so there's balot, which is the fertilized duck egg. There's the salted egg, which in Tagalog is itduk na maalat, or otherwise known as itduk na pula, or red egg. And there's also, um, the third is, uh, um, Penoy, okay? Penoy is a, is, is, a, 
is the duck egg that's put in an incubator that doesn't grow uh, a duckling, okay? So it's not basically like a, 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 an unfertilized duck egg, okay? And so what's wrong with these products? Sorry, just a little duck trivia there, okay? Um, so what's wrong with them? Um, well, some of them aren't even safe. So this on the lower left, that's your red egg. That's your itlog na pula, okay? Salted egg. On the right is as disgusting and gross as it looks, that's balot. So that's uh, the biggest, the most popular duck product in the Philippines. And on top is penway, which doesn't look as appetizing as the one below, okay? And, and um, the thing is that these products have low value. And they, they don't have, they're not like other products that come from duck in other countries. So which country in, in Asia is the biggest consumer of duck? Who can guess? It's super easy. China, exactly. So China eats 20 kilos of Peking duck per person per year. So multiply that by how many people are there in China? China? One billion. So that's 20 billion kilos of duck a year. Can you imagine how big a duck you have to grow to feed China? And um, so, <laughs> so in the Philippines, it's a different story. So that super cute looking duck there, good looking compared to the chicken, is only valued, the duck industry is only valued at 2 billion pesos in the Philippines, whereas the chicken industry is valued at 400 billion pesos. So there's 398 billion pesos to go before I die. I think I'm running out of time. All right, so the industry is so small and it's so vulnerable, okay? Um, in getting into this, you know, from the product, this is what we discovered. So when we started, we didn't have the best business plan. In fact, we actually made it in two hours in a coffee shop. Um, everything was based on assumption. Um, all we had was this product idea, to be honest. We didn't understand the industry yet because there was actually so little, little literature on it. Um, everything was so backyard, everything was so rushed. And all of this, we discovered down the line, right? And we felt that there must have been a relation between those three duck products that we have and the size of the industry. Why? Because a balot is actually, what, 15 pesos, okay? And balot, when you buy it, you buy it from a guy who walks around the street at night shouting, balot! So you probably haven't heard it yet. I don't know if they allow balot vendors inside five-star hotels. Inside hotels, I guess. But they say, if you can't find balot, balot will find you. Seriously, because in the deepest, darkest corners of Manila, you'll hear this guy roaming the streets at the oddest hour selling his product, right? But that duck egg has to travel through so many people. It goes through seven layers of people before it gets to that retailer. You can call him a retailer or her a retailer. And so that 15 pesos that, that you pay to the vendor, he, he or she will actually only get one or two pesos from that per egg. So you don't even cost him his labor or her labor. And the fact that he could get chased by dogs or you know, run over, or right? And he has to work late hours. And so it's the same. The red egg is only 10 pesos, and the penoy, the, the unfertilized stock egg, is only about 10 or 11 pesos. So it's cheap. They're good products. They're excellent products. They're good for your health. Actually, balot super high in protein. It's very good for the heart, etc. Because there is a debate that it has good cholesterol, not bad cholesterol, blah, 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 but it's cheap, right? And so we correlated that with the size of the industry. So how come when you go to other countries, you have Peking duck, right? You have Fabian's favorite, magre. So that's uh, duck breast, okay? And it's actually very, very delicious. You have duck confit, which we also tried to do uh, on your lower left. So that's uh, actually slow cooked for about four to eight hours in its own fat. Okay, you have foie gras. Foie gras, foie gras du canne, okay? So that's um, liver, fatty liver, okay? So how come in other countries from one animal from one bird, you have so many, many good products that are high value. So you go to a Chinese restaurant and Peking duck will cost you a lot. And it feeds the whole, the whole table. You, you don't buy duck magre every day. You buy it for to celebrate, you buy it. It's a very, very high, high quality, high value product, right? And of course, foie gras. Um, we all know how classy they, that is too. And so with this product that I have here, we feel that we were able to increase the value of such a simple, simple product in the Philippines. 
right? So we, this actually sells for double the amount, okay? Although the, the cost is not exactly the lowest, but it sells for double the amount, and guess what? It sells, right? When we launched it, we didn't really even know how we were gonna sell it. We didn't have the best marketing plan. We just said, this is how much we wanna sell it. Let's try putting it in your store. And we had one partner who was willing enough to try it, and, and they actually sell shampoos in their store. They sell soaps. They sell hand sanitizer. And so I, even in approaching them, I was a bit hesitant. And, and I thought, how are duck eggs gonna sell in a place where people go to buy shampoo? duck egg shampoo <laughs> it's, there's so far but then guess what in, in a week they ran out of stock continuously continuously basically we found the market so there are people crazy enough to believe in this vision right of increasing the value of a simple simple product and that's what we felt was a milestone for us and it worked and so we and again we didn't have everything from the start in fact our, we found our identity as a company as we kept on going and we said we want to exist to increase the value of duck products, right? What can you do to increase the value of these products here? Because if you do that, if you create higher value, then maybe, maybe your duck farmer will earn more. Maybe the hatchery will earn more. Maybe the guy selling balot can sell golden eggs instead of balot one day and possibly earn more, right? Maybe if, if you're able to create an outlet for duck farmers and for the duck industry, then duck farmers will be driving nicer cars, right? one day, instead of just riding a bike, or maybe they could send their kids to good schools one day, right? So we want to exist to be able to do that, to create higher value, world-class quality duck products, right? And we believe that this is the first one. And so what's special about this? So it's basically almost the same, except that it's 50% less salty, so it's, it's easier to eat, and you can eat it with different food, different kinds of food. It's colored with turmeric. Okay, turmeric. So I'm half Indian, and when we were looking for a substitute, we were looking so hard and so long and scratching our heads and then realized, wow, I'm not Indian for nothing, right? Why not use turmeric, right? Because it's only going to use, right? So every time I go to my grandmother's house, she uses turmeric, right? Um, and of course, it's sold at a fair price, and we buy at a fair price, okay? So the fresh duck eggs fluctuate, the price fluctuates, because the, again, the industry is so vulnerable to seasonality, to, so there's a time when the demand is strong, there's a time when the demand drops, um, there's, of course, it's, it's livestock, so it's, they're also affected by the weather, so there are farmers who actually have, they, they're actually duck grazers, so they're like cowboys, but for ducks, right? And so they take their ducks to different rice paddies to have them feed, and so they feed for free, basically, but when, when there's a typhoon and the water rises, the duck's neck won't be able to reach the bottom of the red spine, right? So what do they do now? They have to start spending, and then their margins go lower, and then, then they're, they're affected, right? And so the demand of, of uh, duck eggs is highest when there's school. So school in the Philippines is from June to May, or March, March. March. <laughs> to March, sorry. June to March. So when there's summer, demand drops, right? Prices drop. So it's, it's, it's a duck boy world there, instead of cowboy. It's the wild, wild west for duck farmers out there. 70% are backyard racers, meaning literally back of my house, I have a duck pen, right? They're not registered, there's no standard, there's no sanitation, and they only talk to each other when they want to agree on price. All right, so coming into an industry like this, looking like a foreigner in his own country, of course I was fooled a lot, oh, this person's rich, he can, whatever yes he, he has nice fake shoes that he bought in the in the, in the side of the road and maybe i could fool him and so indeed we were fooled a lot but we had to go through that to understand the industry and what it needs because we want to be able to create an impact in the industry and so we started with just a very small batch of ducks so they said if you want to learn the industry you have to experience everything race your own ducks know what it's like to make them happy make them sad what do you have to do to make them lay more eggs so apparently they can't get stressed out you can't change their food, right? Sometimes you even have to play music for them just so they can relax. I'm not joking, I've seen that before. And um, so we even made mistakes like that. We even fed them pig feeds one night, okay? And what happened? They stopped laying eggs. And so when I tried to think, where did they stop laying eggs? I looked at the feeds that I bought. It was feeds for pigs, not for ducks. And so I became the laughing stock of the GK community, of Shannon and everyone. And they said, oh, your ducks are taking birth control pills. Uh, they don't want eggs anymore. Okay? <laughs> so we had to go.
go through what we had to go through, really. We learned on the field the hard way. And eventually, we got to scale up to more docs. So we, ha we handled a bigger operation. And we got to develop the brand and the product. Okay? So that the, everything started to form. Right? So traditionally, you, you normally want all of this before you start the business. But in our case, it came as we were, we were running the business. Okay? And we found our business model, uh, which was really to just farm meat and eggs, rethink our duck products. So what can you do to innovate them? So in such a small industry in the Philippines, there's so much room for change, for innovation. And so that's an advantage for us. And if you're able to produce these products, turn them out, then you generate new revenue streams for duck farmers, right? So you, this, this product is, is very traditional. The red one, your grandmother knows. If you're in the Philippines, everyone knows this product, basically. But we've been able to take it out of its shell and uh, turn it into something more innovative. Uh, something that has more class and more value. And then we develop things like the Duck Burger, okay? So working with people from our, from, from our network in GK who come and intern with us, uh, mostly from France, like over here, this is uh, Alex, and the guy on the left with the glasses is Clément. And that's us uh, frying up our Duck Burgers in the Rockwell Ultimate Taste Test. So this is a very uh, popular food blog, uh, organized by a food blogger that's very popular. And uh, guess what? We actually won. <laughs> so we won third place in the main dish category. Uh, we beat the chon, we, we, we beat chicken wings, we beat all the regular uh, food you know, that's very popular. And wow, we were surprised. So duck can work, right? Duck can actually work in this country. That's what I'm slowly starting to believe. Hopefully I'm not wrong, right? Because that's the challenge. How do you make duck sexy? for Filipinos, right? More than just the eggs, because there's more than eggs in, in, in the duck world. Okay, and that's what we're, we're striving to do, really. How do you make it sexy to the Filipino? Because if you're able to brand duck as something sexy, something attractive, something, of course, delicious and tasty and of, of consistent quality, then maybe your industry will be affected. Maybe people will value duck farmers more, value the fresh duck egg more, the duck meat everything that we're producing here. So that's our duck burger. And um, yeah, I guess just to wrap up, uh, that's our supposedly our motherhood statement. But uh, we're really here to create impact into the industry through developing innovative products. So we have our duck burger, we have our golden duck egg, and uh, we're actually now selling Peking ducks also. So who would have known, no one knew until two years ago, or three years ago, that you could actually grow Peking duck in the Philippines, okay? So we're actually bigger consumers of duck in Asia than any other part of the world. I mean, China alone, right? So Japan eats duck. Filipinos are starting to eat more and more duck. And all the uh, cosmopolitan restaurants now starting and growing. So there's a scene now. People are looking for new food, right? So we just have to be able to catch that market. That's what we want to do. Um, in, in the two and a half years that we've been doing this, this, this product has taken the lead, uh, the golden duck egg. So all it takes, all it took, <laughs> You know, two years we were trying to really market it, give our spills, but all it took was one person to say that it was delicious. So a very famous TV personality featured the product and said, it's so delicious. And she said, Alvi, your eggs are so big. And I said, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to say to that? Okay, so I said, yes, they are, try them. And so she tried them, she liked it. And guess what? Um, how many millions of people saw that on TV? And they saw it, and now the product is, we're almost always out of stock every time we produce. So it, it pays, it pays to, to try, I guess, right? So doing something different, doing something crazy can work with the right support system. And if, if your mission is, is simply to, to create impact into your industry as well, you know, not just into your pocket, then it can, it is more likely to work, right? So that's basically it, thanks guys. Thank you, Alvi. But he's gonna be. It's an iced tea based, also from the farm we started, also just a year ago. We made out of lemongrass, uh, uh, Philippine lemon, calamansi, and then pandan or school pine, uh, which is a natural. All of these are actually, uh, actually, <laughs> um, the formulation came from Gawad Kalina, uh, our our the mothers in our community in the farm, and they started it. We just partnered with them, standardized it, and now we're selling this just across there in Bose Coffee. We're selling in uh, an intern as well in, in the Philippines with us in Gawad Kalinga. 
There was nothing much in the farm there, so he really couldn't do much, so he basically complained the whole time. <laughs> it's okay, we, com we complained also. So we fought a lot, but it's okay. Uh, but now he's one of the best uh, Filipinos that I really know. And I always say that every time I introduce him, because truly, anybody who loves this country, I believe, is a good Filipino. And so, Fabian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, as Shannon mentioned, my name is Fabian, 24 years old, come from France. Uh, it's easy to say that I complain. They basically come from Manila, then they went to Bulacan. I heard I had the same speech than them, but I came from France. I took a flying ticket to come here, then to be brought to Bulacan to see the same thing as them. So, of course, I was a bit more, you know, disappointed, a bit more challenged. And especially, you know, when you come here, you stop your studies, you come here, you uh, it was basically part of an internship, so your school is expecting you to to give something. Uh, you are planning to see the Enchanted Farm Village University, and when you tell them you just do farming, eventually they, there's something happens. So I was doing my master. So back then I was doing my master entrepreneurship, and I was already in mind of you know I want to set up my own business, but in the same time I want to do you know business with the heart. I want to do a business that's not the one we always make responsible for the different issues we have, the ones that are firing, the ones that are damaging the environment. I believe that you know businesses have the power also to change society for the good. So I was thinking on how can I make a business that will be you know, better. And we heard about social entrepreneurship, which was very new three years ago. That's what pushed me to come here. Because Gawad Kelinga was one of the first ones to, to talk about it. It just happened I met a Filipino through an organization of, through a big student's organization, talked talk to me about GK, and I got curious, and I came here. And I was supposed to be just three months. So I spent three months in this place, the Enchanted Farm, which was just just mud. But eventually, the three months I had, I had no choice, I had to wait for my flying ticket anyway. So I decided to, to make it worth it, to spend time with the families there, to spend time with the kids, to learn more about Gawad Kelinga, to learn more about this organization. And, and basically I got a miss. Maybe you just saw a sneak peek of it, but this is really a big organization that has transforming slums into peaceful communities, that has impacting so many lives already, and keeps on reinventing themselves to come up with new ideas, with new innovation. And actually, something that kept me here. So from three months, I extended to seven months, then extended to a year, then to two years, then to three years, because I really like mud. So I decided <laughs> to stay. But eventually, since my background was entrepreneurship, I just planning to you know, offer my, my skills, offer my knowledge to the existing entrepreneurs. Because I, I had no plan in staying in the Philippines. I was just looking for ideas that I can eventually bring back home. I was looking for patterns, framework that I can eventually replicate in France. But eventually you had already some entrepreneurs starting their businesses, so I can start supporting them. Let's say I can offer them some costings, finance, marketing skills that, that I study at home. Then eventually one day, when I was selling the different products from the farm, so I was selling the tea, I was selling the garden next to a crowd of about 800 people. And you have so many kids during this day. There was a family event, but I realized we had no products that were dedicated for the kids. And I found it sad, because you know, they brought their own family, and you have this Filipino tradition, which is the pasalubong. You always need to buy something wherever you go. So I was thinking, we need to offer something for the kids. So I just started looking at the toy industry, and I, I realized that such a big industry as well, it's $100 billion all over the world. And I was thinking that maybe it could be something that can provide jobs also in the community, since my host family was actually a carpenter. So I was thinking maybe you can make some toys out of wood, and eventually something that you can sell as a souvenir item. Back then, just a livelihood idea, just providing jobs to my host family in the farm. But as a good student in master, what I did is I studied the environment, I studied the industry, I studied the competition, and I just realized that I was studying something that does not exist. The Filipino <laughs> toy industry does not exist. All the toys that you will find in the market are imported. They all come from one country, which is the one you know, that eat a lot of dogs, so we already <laughs> talked about them. And the sad thing in the Philippines is you have different statistics that eventually will come in. And it shows that eight out of 10 toys available in the Philippines contain toxic chemicals. Concept lead, chromium, mercury, different type of heavy metals. And I was thinking, that's, that's stupid. Why the Filipinos are importing so many products that are actually dangerous for their kids? Or why are they importing something if they can make something much better here? What's the point of importing them? And that's what the definition of complaining for French, like 
this is not how it should be. But at the same time, you look on how you can, you can make it better. It's actually pushing me to start you know, thinking about it. It could be a good business idea. It can provide jobs. So we have the simple value proposition, which was, let's make toys locally, so that we can provide jobs back to our carpenters, we can provide jobs back to different families in the countryside. The second aspect was, let's provide toys also that will be safer, that will be you know, more environmentally friendly, so that we make sure that the kids are not in danger while playing. And the third aspect was, let's make it Filipino. Because if you look at most of the toys, since they are all imported, like the stupid cat from Japan, so it is Japanese, <laughs> like SpongeBob, but eventually it does not connect at all with Filipino, it does not connect at all with the people in Laos, Vietnamese, Taiwanese, this, this is from Japan, so how come this is the favorite toy of the kids? It's not connecting with the culture, it's not embodying any Filipino values. So it just started a simple idea like this. So I started with wood. My teacher was a carpenter, wooden toy is something very popular in France, but eventually in the Philippines you have different issues with wood. Wood is a highly linked with politic uh, products because most of the time you know, people made money out of deforestation, made money out, out of illegal cutting, illegal wood, especially in the Philippines. I don't really know how is it everywhere in Southeast Asia. But that was the, the problem. So I started looking at other materials that we could use and I focused on bamboo. So bamboo is, is really a product, it's a grass. The more you cut, the more it grows. It's the uh, fastest sustainable material we have on Earth. It's really, you know, it has so many environmental benefits. And so many countries in Asia know already, like China, Vietnam, Indonesia, they're already ahead when it comes to bamboo. But the Philippines is not yet organized. Their bamboo industry does not exist. But I started looking at bamboo and make toys, make toys out of it. So I was able to come up with the bamboo jeepney. I don't know if you, you've seen the jeepneys in the Philippines, the famous public transportation. Then I was able to make a prototype of bamboo banca, make a prototype of different uh, wooden shapes, uh, bamboo shapes, different bamboo items. And I was able to make only seven prototypes. But from these seven prototypes, that was already something that has never been done in the Philippines. And like the rest of the team, we tried to come up with something unique and we start having people talking about it. And I was invited at the National Bamboo Congress. I was invited at the different fair organized by the Department of Trade and Industry. So you have a French guy just dis displaying seven bamboo toys and start getting some orders, people asking for about 100 pieces. So I was becoming, yeah, this can be a business idea. I can provide jobs to the carpenter now. And eventually I realized that I cannot be the one to do it because whenever I was trying to make uh, bamboo toys, I was very close to lose one of my fingers because there is no carpentry classes when you study master entrepreneurship. So <laughs> you're not ready for it. So I was partnering with someone from the community that was really more skilled, uh, that has more skill than me we're coming up with more products, but eventually we got uh, into different issues, which is supply chain. Supply chain is one of the big issues we have in the Philippines. That's why we put up the farm village university. You cannot really scale up industries, you cannot really scale up businesses if you have no supply chain. So I started looking for bamboo, and I won't keep it too long, but to give you an idea, you order bamboo from someone, it just cuts it from the next property, brings bamboo to you, and it's not what you order. But since it comes with the machete or the bolo, you have no choice than to pay him. So you look for other suppliers that eventually have you know, trucking business, something like this, but same, they deliver 100 bamboo poles, that's not what you want, it's too, it's too early, it has been cut too early, it won't last, or it has been treated with chemicals. So basically I entered an industry that was not really developed, was not really ready, so I got frustrated. And what we did, we planted bamboo all over the farm. So if you get the chance to visit the farm, you will see 3,000 bamboo everywhere in the farm. But it will take three years for the bamboo to be ready. And when it's rainy season, you cannot harvest bamboo. So I was there, in the middle of the farm, I have my bamboo, what do I do? I, I water them, I sing them songs like for the ducks, <laughs> I tell them story, uh, just to make sure I can have my supplies to make the bamboo toys. But eventually I started thinking that, well, by the time I'm just watching my bamboo growing, I'm not creating any jobs, which was my initial purpose. I wanna provide jobs to the families in the community. So I started looking at other type of toys I could make. So, uh, you know, I started talking with the mothers in the community and just realizing that the province we are based, Bulacan, used to be the major area for textile in the Philippines. You had so many factories where they were producing for the biggest garments uh, brands, the biggest clothes brands, and everything is closing down. For the past decade, everything is outsourced to our friends eating ducks. So, like, you have thousands of women that have lost their job 
They're all lost their job in Bulacan, but they still have the skills, they still have the talent, and most of them still have sewing machine. So we just started connecting with them, and we started making stuff toys. So from hard toys, bamboo toys, decided to move to stuff toys. So it's a long story, like how does a French guy end up doing stuff toys in the Philippines? Like, wow, so many things happen. I have to, to keep it short, but if ever you go to the farm, I, I will explain you the full, full story. So we started looking at stuff toys. And again, I had no idea on how to make stuff toys, like not at all. It's not part of my classes as well, not part of my subject. So I start, you know, watching YouTube, start watching how do you make stuff toys, how do you make patterns, start drawing patterns on paper, working with one of the models from the community, and trying to make a tomato. Because, you know, this place is called Enchanted Farm, so what you're supposed to find in a farm is fruits and vegetables. So we are trying to make a tomato, which, like, did not look like a tomato at all. I cannot even say what, what was it. So we try, you know, try and error. So everything we do in the farm is basically try and error. We are building a place which is like demanding enough for you to really build the best of yourself, but at the same time it's a forgiving enough environment for you to make mistakes, for you to try to make some errors and to learn from it. So we just did prototypes. So we prototype every day until we get something that eventually is becoming cute. And I was able to sell it in, the, in our grassroots kitchen, which is our dining area. So I made one, I was able to sell one. So I said, okay. So I, I tasted the market. I can, I can sell stuff toys. So we went back, we started to make several tomato, several other fruits and vegetables. And eventually we realized that this is not enough. If you want to, to be able to compete with the stupid cat from Japan, you have to put a face on it. So we started putting a face on our tomato. So it has cute eyes, a mouth. So now we say, okay, we can put side by side. But it's not yet enough. Everybody likes Hello Kitty. Everybody finds it more popular. So how do you make it you know, different? How do you make it connect with the Filipinos? So basically what we did is we connected to, to the Philippine icons, to the Philippine celebrities. So we have some Filipinos in the room. Yeah. You might have to translate to your neighbors why, why we call the fruits and vegetables like this. But basically a tomato in Tagalog is kamatis. So we call our tomato and kamatis. And you basically have one of the biggest endorsers of the country, which her name is Ann Curtis. <laughs> so the Filipinos starting, you know, connecting a small tomato with the biggest endorser of the country. And it, it became a buzz. People starting, you know, posting on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So this is our Ann Kamatis. <laughs> it's just a simple tomato named after a celebrity. You can just pass it around if you want. And we just realized that, hey, this is it. We were able to connect with the Philippine market. We were able to come up with something that's our unique competitive advantage. So we thought that we can make more. Then through social media, Facebook, Twitter, few months after, we get Anne Curtis posting on our own uh, Instagram account pictures with the tomato. And the following day, you know, she has a show every day uh, around lunchtime. You have five million people watching the show. She introduced herself saying that her name was Anne Kamatis. And the buzz was done, it's there. So we started looking at, oh, what other fruits and vegetables can we make and what other celebrities can we use? So we came up with a watermelon. So I think this one is, is the one you can understand. So watermelon in Tagalog is Pakwan. And the Philippines are known for boxing. They have a famous boxer that just a few days ago won against his, uh, his bed. So our watermelon is actually Mani Pakwan. So this one is, is a bit more international. It, it became also a celebrity. We haven't been able to reach Mani Pacquiao yet. He has some tax issues. We just wait. Uh, we just wait for him to to come back into the you know the good part of his life. Then we also came up with another one, which maybe is too Filipino, but we have an actor who is called Coco Martin. So we have Coco Martin as well. So it's just a simple. Simple coconut. Then we also got a picture of Coco Martin holding the, the coconut on his Instagram. So really we find people helping us. This one is also a bit more international. You all know American Idol, right? So banana in Tagalog is sagin. And you have one of the Filipinas just got famous from American Idol. Her name is Jessica Sanchez. So we have our Jessica sagin as well, which is, which is our current bestseller. So it just started like that. You know, you just come up with the idea of providing jobs. Then eventually you try to compete with something that's globally known. You try to connect with the Philippine market. So from, from one simple stuff toy, we were able to, you know, to make five, 10, 100, 1,000, 5,000. Now we sold more than 7,000 small stuff toys like this, the small one. And all of them has been produced in the farm. And what's unique about our stuff toys, those are in stage. 
the stuff that we have on stage. The reason why we are on stage we have is first, we want to showcase their skills. We want to make sure that everybody knows about the talents that this woman in Bula can have. And the second reason why we make it on stage is to provide them a more convenient setup for working. Because when they were working in the factory, that was very demanding from early in the morning to late in the evening, not able to see their families, not able to, to spend time with them, cook for their husband. So basically, we provide them an opportunity to work from their houses. In the farm, you will see, they have reached five kids. Even some of, our, some of our mothers have 10 kids. So it's like a full-time job. They are full-time mother. Then you have a Filipino husband. And for me, a Filipino husband is like another kid. So it's like two full-time jobs. So if you want them to, to, to work from 8 in the morning to 5 in the evening, it's really challenging. So we provide that type of setup. And we started with just one mother, and we keep on adding. So we went from one to two to three. Now we have about 25 of them that are doing the stuff toys on a weekly basis. So if you go to the farm, we have a workshop where we have the sewing machine, but there's ne ne nobody inside. Nobody's using the workshop. But if you visit the farm, you go inside the houses, you see one person and stitching a CD, which his name is CD Crawford, by the way, if you know <laughs> Filipino again. You go to the next house, we are doing the banana. You go to the next house, they are doing the watermelon. So what we did now is we expand it to another community. So we just bring a simple idea, connecting with existing skills, try to make it unique in the market, try to make it sellable so that you can provide jobs to them. So our target is actually to provide jobs to 500 mothers, 500 families in Bulacan. Eventually this can be replicated in, in so many places. You know, you can bring it to Indonesia, you can bring it to, to Vietnam, Laos, and you do the same. You try to connect with celebrities if eventually it works name of the fruits and vegetables we've celebrated, that would be awesome. So we just started, we found, we found a flagship product, we found a flagship toys. But our idea is to really change the whole toy industry. Since it does not exist in the Philippines, it's just an, an empty space for us to create. Philippines has a lot of material that we can use. There is a lot of designers. Philippines is known for being one of the most talented country in the world when it comes to design, graphic design, very creative country. So we started, you know, connecting with designers, preschool teacher, and we tried to really revolution the way kids are playing. The full Filipino learning experience when it comes to kids. So that they can play with products that are proudly Filipino. With, with a bit of French touch, of course, because I'm here. But we tried to make it proudly Pinay. Everything in Tagalog, you know, the Philippine language. We come up with storybooks. So storybooks are using our fruits and vegetables to basically tell the GK stories, tell the GK message that we have. So we can also, you know, from the very early age, raise a new generation of young Filipinos that will be wealth creator, that will be proud of their country, that can connect with the land. That's why the name of the company is actually Patang Bayani, which means young heroes in Tagalog. So this is this is basically the whole the whole story behind it. So I have so far I don't have any plans to go home, but I don't have any plans to just stick with Star Toys. I'm looking at you know expanding it to any type of toys, any type of uh, things that will come for the kids, that will be from the kids' environment. And one of the things very unique we want to do is, Philippines is also known for you know coconut fibers, for banana fibers, pineapple fibers. Something very unique we want to make is the banana we sell is made out of banana fiber. The coconut we sell is made out of coconut fiber. And at the same time, that will be one way for us to connect our manufacturing business with the land, connect with agriculture. Because most of the businesses you've seen earlier or you heard are uh, agriculture base or uh, food base. So for us it's challenging. We try to sell something that's not eatable, but at the same time it's non perishable. So we just feel that the Philippines is like an empty space where you have so many industries to develop since they just import everything. Everything is imported from from Europe or from China. So we just try to raise a new generation of entrepreneurs. Tito Tony said half a million Filipinos, but eventually it can be a global community of entrepreneurs. That's where you can also have fr French entrepreneurs, you can also have Indonesian entrepreneurs, or I don't know where you all come from, Vietnam entrepreneurs, Vietnamese. We just create an empty space for everybody to work together. Because the, the, the world is basically you know, more and more connected. Now it's easy to have, a, to have a discussion with someone from all over the world. It's easy to have a business with someone from all over the world. So we just try to make it inclusive. That's why we're very happy to see all of you tomorrow coming from different backgrounds, not only French and Filipinos that looks like Indians. So we also bring some, some other people. So that's, that's just basically the story behind the stuff toys. If you go to the farm, you can you know, continue the discussion or if you have any questions also, you can ask tonight. Thank you. Thanks.
Uh, we'll have uh, time to really discuss more about whether there's no problem with our communities. There's no problem with land. There's no problem with money, capital. Uh, investors are waiting for something to invest in. There's no problem with technology, ideas, skills of, uh, of our communities. Our problem is that we don't have enough of them. We don't have enough of Alvi and Fabian in this country to really create opportunities for our land. We're calling them the missing middle. These are the people who are educated, who have the opportunities, who can create business models, who can create business plans, or can learn them, uh, just like Alvi uh, did, and can think long term, but also can think community. Can also think, hey, how many jobs am I creating? Well, it's not just about jobs. It's about a long term engagement, about building a long term relationship with these communities and see how we can really get them out of poverty. And so we believe that these are the kinds of people that we need uh, to really help end poverty. And believe it or not, you guys are this missing middle as well. You guys are part of this. And you guys are at a critical point in your lives where you can really choose to break the cycles of poverty. And this is what we want to propose. That this is just this is a platform where we can all work together. It is a platform where we can all make mistakes, learn from each other, learn together, develop business models, develop projects, develop things that we can do uh, to really get uh, abundance, no? to really build abundance. So these are the people, like for example, Ron uh, in the blue next to Alvi. Is my business partner for Bayani Bruder. These are all social entrepreneurs that are running enterprises. I will just run through some of them uh, before we close. Uh, of course, you know, human nature, they do uh, personal care products. Uh, they're one of the biggest social enterprises in the country. Uh, they just started five years ago, and they have over uh, 100 different products with branches all over the country. 70,000 dealers of these products. Oh, we have our own cafe. Nicola over there uh, is running our cafe. This is in Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, we have, of course, our cheese, which we talked about. Uh, and, and we have, of course, uh, Avi's eggs. And um, <laughs> yeah, golden eggs, golden duck. Of course, Bayani Brew, for example, which is another one, Fabian's enterprise. And so there are, there are many of those. And this is just a handful of the many things we can do. All we had to do was and all Alvi and Fabian and all of our entrepreneurs had to do was grow the courage to care. Uh, grow the, the, because it's so hard to, to, to create these things. It's very hard. Once I was calling up Fabian, I said, oh, Fabian, where are you? Oh, I'm lost up in the north part of Luzon. I don't know where I am. I traveled for four or five hours and now I'm lost. I wanted to meet somebody and uh, for bamboo, blah, blah, blah. It's so difficult to care. We need to find the courage to do it. And we need to find the courage to love. And I think that's where it all starts. And uh, again, Gawat Kalinga came from a very difficult place and it started there. And we're still continuing to journey as an organization from just you know, the basics that we've been serving to now trying to achieve higher and higher things, more and more so that we can fuel the dreams of our communities and build more communities in the process. And we, we are proposing to build this uh, Farm Village University where we can raise a whole new platform, a whole new army of social entrepreneurs who can create abundance and really break the cycle of poverty by building sustainable enterprises. And so that's the whole proposal. And that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, just, I guess, before we end, what we've learned so far, if you wanted to start your own social enterprise, if you wanted to do something, what are the things that we've learned that works? One, I think what we've realized is that if you want to start a social enterprise, please don't do it alone. Please make sure that you work with as many people and always be a relationship builder. Because if you dream alone, most likely you will fail. Or most likely your dream is too small because you can do it alone. So we're dreaming big because we know we can't end poverty alone. We need you. We need Fabian. We need Alvin. Second, um, start small, but think big. Alvi started with his eggs, just a handful of these uh, small little eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just I'll just use Fabian as an example. Uh, <laughs> easier. We just started with that, but now he's thinking, how do you change whole industries? Bayani Brew started in just pots and pans, uh, but we're looking 7 billion liters of non-alcoholic beverages are drunk every year in the Philippines. 
And most of it is with Coca-Cola, and I think we need to change that. Right? So these are the things we need to do. Start small, but think big. Now, you know, Bayani Brew is being produced in a factory, now it's nationwide. Uh, but we have to continue to dream, uh, and we have to continue to dream with our communities and work for a common vision. And this is a vision that we can all work together at. And I guess in everything that we want to do, in everything that we want to continue doing as we go back home, uh, we hope that you, if there's one thing that you can take on uh, from this, is that again, uh, please just start something big, dream something big, dream up something, conjure up something big, and don't be afraid to do it. Build it and they will come. Uh, so that's it for us. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Uh, we'll be open for some questions. Uh, whoever, whoever that, for, for anyone, Alvi or Fabian.